Hello there, Riverland and Long Prairie Gray Eagle. Uh, Tuesday, February 23rd. Why do I always have to say the date? It doesn't make any sense. I'm trying to stay oriented on uh, space and time. Similar remarks to how I kicked off things yesterday for at least a couple of my classes. I'm living in three imaginary worlds with my precious students. My honors lit class. Is, uh, just coming off the Gulf of Mexico and heading uh, towards Mississippi, the state of William Faulkner. Where they wrote a story last night called Barn Burning, which followed Hemingway. And F. Scott Fitzgerald awaits them before break. And uh, My humanites, as I call them, are uh, starting in on Beowulf because we're starting a big medieval unit, the second of three big fat units, as we study uh, tensions, paradoxes between the self and the soul. They're going to be reading Chaucer, the Beowulf poet, Chaucer, the Pearl poet, and uh, Dante. And you guys, my captive charges in Comp 2, from Brainerd all the way down to southern Minnesota, Austin, whatever town you live in, we are continuing our study of heroes. And we are going after a very famous story, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, which I'm returning to after a, a little bit of a break. And I'm Running this music because it's medieval and I think it's beautiful. And I, I'll just say the obvious. I, I love the medieval period. I love medieval music. I love looking at medieval manuscripts, illustrated uh, manuscripts. Um, I love maps from the medieval period, the stories, all of it. And I'd, I'd go there in a heartbeat. I patterned my whole life on the on a medieval idea. I got it when I was 18 years old. Let's live near a monastery, St. John's. Let's get land in the country, and I did. And let's have the monastery provide all possible needs that I would have professionally for work. It lasted 21 years. Um, intellectually, spiritually, etc. And I'm still living a um, medieval idea. And one of the things I tried to convince my students yesterday was that there's a particular kind of silence, a special silence um, that you can inhabit when you um, study the Middle Ages. I told them I didn't mean silence as in silence is, is the way a, a hard of hearing or deaf person would experience the world. I said yesterday afternoon at one o'clock early in my class, to my humanites as I joke and call them, when Beowulf lands on the shore and he gets out of his boat, again the Anglo-Saxons believed that ships were living things. I could hear sounds. I could hear the wind in the trees. I could hear the clatter of the armor and the mail shirts. Uh, I could hear the waves of, of the sea lapping on the pebbles as that Badass Swede uh, reports for hero duty. Um, I mean, I mean something a little bit different. I mean, a quieter world. Imagine a world where there was no electricity whatsoever, um, and any sounds that you wanted to hear, you had to make your own. Like those guys singing polyphony. That was Guillaume Dumanchot. Um, very early medieval uh, music. I uh, a couple other thoughts on silence. I um, read somewhere that. Silence is a commodity. You can buy it. The wealthier or the smarter you are, the more quiet your world will, will be. And the poorer you are, and here you can think of any man or woman or child living in an inner city, maybe a poor place. Uh, think Mexico City, think, I don't, I don't know, Rio de Janeiro, wherever, any slum. Um, it's, it's loud there. There's, there's a lot of uh, loudness. And how grateful I am to have uh, different kinds of silence. And my last thought in this segment which got a little longer than I thought was. Once in a while, you should think about how loud your world is. Um, the world, partic particularly of entertainment, the loudness of our music, the loudness available on the internet, um, our movies, which are increasingly violent and pornographic, and there I've said that again, but it's true. Um, and the loudness of your phone that none of us can look away from. The medieval period calls us to look over our shoulder and enter into and inhabit a world where it's a little bit quieter. I want to read a, a poem today about an older dude because I'm feel, lately I've been feeling a little bit older. And that would be because I'm getting older. Quick look in the mirror um, uh, assures me of that. And i uh, got a question for you that I forgot to ask my 9 o'clock class yesterday. I'm super embarrassed about that. And it's an important question. I ask it all the time or find a way to ask it. 
And that should lead to um, a story that I want to tell you. Um, not, we're not done with Joseph Campbell. <clears throat> you guys are going to have an opportunity to prove a few things next week in a midterm, like a for real midterm. And I haven't busted one of those out in a while, but I am. So you're, you're going to have an, a, a really good chance to prove that you've been reading. Not only the literature, listening to me in these videos, a little bit of adult there. Um, some of you are, and I, I love you both, whether you're paying attention here or not. Uh, it's up to you. you got to decide what kind of integrity you want to have. And you're going to have to um, prove that you read uh, that excerpt from uh, Joseph Campbell. And today is as good a day as any to talk about a time in my life where I sort of enacted my own hero journey. This is usually a story that is bound up and confined in classical mythology. A lot of stuff that stays in classical mythology stays in classical mythology. i got to grab it, though, because we're reading about heroes. And um, you, you can't study heroes without Campbell. And I can't think about heroes um, without thinking about the one time I, I went on a very dangerous trip. And I'm going to tell you that story. And I want to put that story to a couple of different purposes. I've decided that this is the week. <clears throat> this is absolutely the week where I'm going to give my little safety talk. And it doesn't have that much to do with English, but it has a lot to do with life. And the first part of it is going to be with this video, and the second part is going to come with, with, with your second video. And, and the main thing is, we're, we're getting very close to warm weather. And that's a very dangerous time um, for young people. And I'm going to prove that um, with um, some tales that, of terror that should curl your hair. And if, if you already have curly hair, and I hope some of you do, it's going to get curlier. So all you got to do is put up with a poem here, a question, <clears throat> that I'll kind of answer for you because I'm kind of talking to myself again. But I want to start with this poem by uh, Czesław Miłosz. Um, we haven't read him in a while. I adore this guy, this Polish poet, who somehow lived well into his 90s. And I, I, I needed a poem with kind of a hero or a hero in it. I needed a poem that had someone going on a journey. And I needed, a, uh, I needed him to be a little bit older like me. I think, I think the character in this poem is 61. I'm just joking. Czesla Miłosz, this only. A valley, and above it, forests in autumn colors. A voyager arrives. A map led him here. Or perhaps memory. Once, long ago, in the sun, when the snow fell. Excuse me. When the first snow fell, riding this way, he felt joy, strong, without reason, joy of the eyes. Everything was the rhythm of shifting trees, of a bird in flight, of a train on the viaduct, a feast of motion. He returns later, years later, has no demands. He wants only one most precious thing, to see purely and simply, without name, without expectations, fears, or hopes, at the edge where there is no I or not I. I bungled that reading a little bit. I think, did I say viaduct? I think it's viaduct. I should have checked that pronunciation. So the question that I forgot to ask my 9 o'clock class, and they suffer because I'm sleepy. I shouldn't even be teaching morning classes. But I remembered, uh, in time to ask my 11 o'clock people, my question was simple, and really not simple. I said, you guys, tell me right now what I want to know right now, this very moment. What is the relationship between art and reality? I should mention that before I asked them that question, I said, how many of you like to make stuff? How many of you in your little Zoom squares can give me a thumbs up or a hand wave? And a lot of people want, 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 put their hands up. And I put before them a question that I put before my humanites, my humanity students. Wouldn't it be great if we spent an hour making something for every hour that we consume something? Pick up a guitar, pick up a paintbrush, try to sing, um, dance once in a while. Get get yourself some Play-Doh and make a make a sculpture, um, make, make a mask, make a doll. Do do something with your creativity and your imagination. And yet we're all looking in our phones, dreaming of elsewhere, and um, watching television and Netflix and stuff. And, some of that's about the pandemic, and some of, about it, of it is about modernity and, and where we are. And they went back and forth. They did a pretty good job. And I wasn't trying to speed things along or bottom line it, but I did let them know. If reality and art, in my experience, get too close, reality keeps going, but art is destroyed. 
And I had a rather brutal story for them, and I'm going to tell it to you right now. When I was a kid, I'd be lying if I said I was there. Maybe I told this in the fall. I uh, was reading a newspaper sitting on the porch of my old family home, my family's old home on the Mississippi River, and I read that the night before at the Guthrie Theater, an, an actor had had a, a, a serious mishap. There was a play going on, and whatever the play was, I have no idea what, what it was, can't even remember, but some scene in that play called on the actor to take this knife at a podium and jab it, like slam it onto a document, and then hold it up. I don't know what the document was, maybe a declaration of war. But the, the night I read about, the actor missed. Or to put it another way, the actor hit the target. You, you know where this is going. Instead of night after night after night doing what he was supposed to do, hitting that document, it went into his hand. The, like the blade was sticking out. And the blood was real. And everybody went, wow, that's real. You just, you just put a knife through your hand. Well, the play was over, wasn't it? Everybody went home, not knowing what happened. Oh, I should. I wonder if that's. I wonder if I could Google that up. That happened. Okay. Um, everybody's um, state of disbelief um, was became belief. It wasn't suspended anymore, and that was that was it. So, what I want to talk about. Um, literature has made me do all kinds of things. Um, Maybe I've mentioned other days, I ran marathons, for instance, when I was young, before I decided that 26 miles was just stupid far. I quit my last one, my ninth one. And I ran, I, why did I start doing marathons? Because of the Greeks, because of that story of Pheidippides. Um, and, I, and I could go on and on and I'll belabor you with a, a, a lot of examples. But there's no doubt, and you can see him over my shoulder here, I'm pointing right at him right now. It was Dr. Stephen B. Humphrey, the kind of teacher that they named an auditorium over after at St. John's. Stephen B. Humphrey put uh, Joseph Campbell's uh, Hero with a Thousand Faces in my lap when I was maybe 20 years old. And I read this thing backwards and forwards. Uh, this 1949 uh, absolute classic, um, um, class, classic textbook um, mythology. So, I'm not, I don't want to tell you that I read the book and went, wow, I'm going to go on a hero journey. Not quite. But I did make a series of decisions that I enacted um, in a story that I want to tell you. All you got to do is just relax and let me tell this. And um, I know that this was in here. I know that at, at the level of the DNA, Campbell was in there. But I didn't really realize it until some years in the future. And the, the, the story is relatively simple. I, I went on a hero journey. Now, why is this part of my safety talk for the week? Because this story is one I want to particularly direct at young men in this class. Adam Wilder, I am talking to you, and you're going west, aren't you? Adam Wilder, sweet Adam, is going all the way to Portland, to the rocky shores of Portland, as he just wrote me in an e email that I really appreciate. Okay, that's the direction, right? West, it's the biggest direction of them all, and that's where young men want to go uh, <coughs> on adventures. We're drawn there, and you got to watch it. Uh, this was most poignantly put before many thousands and thousands of high school students with that book, Into the Wild. I bet it's on the shelf of your high school classroom, if, if, you, if you're in high school still. That's a nonfiction book that's all about a guy who went to Alaska and died there. A young man burned up his money, dies in a bus thousands of miles uh, from where he was born. That wasn't quite almost me, but kind of almost was. So let's just spill it. Here's how it went. And as I go through this, I will um, make sure that I tick off each of the boxes uh, that Joseph Campbell says are elements in a classic hero story. Okay, we're studying heroes, and next time I'll, we'll get back to uh, research writing because we got to get going on that project. And let's just put it simply, I stole my wife's girlfriend. I already told you that. I stole my wife's girlfriend. Uh, I stole my best friend's girlfriend, uh, and it took about two and a half years to talk my wife, my current, my, my only wife, into marrying me. We've been married 34 years. And it was kind of a rough start because she was kind of half in love with me and she was half in love with a good friend of mine, John Moriarty, who has no idea I'm talking about him on the internet. And there was this moment in the spring of 1983 where my future wife said to me, I need space. I can't make up my mind. And I'm like, okay, cool. I'll give you space. I want you to enter into a story with me, but I want you to be sure about it. So I'm going to give you three, three four months of space. I'm going to hitchhike to Alaska. 
I'm gonna hitchhike all the way to Alaska, and I'm gonna I'm gonna work and um, do goodness knows what up there. And when I come back in the fall, I want the answer. I want your up, down, yes or no on whether you'll marry me. So I started out with my friend Michael Steiner, a 350-pound dude from Chicago, Illinois, like a brother to me. And uh, we headed out. Um, nobody hitchhikes anymore because hitchhiking even then was crazy. But we hitchhiked all the way uh, to Seattle. And then we headed up north into British Columbia. Back then, there were only two ways to get from British Columbia to the Yukon. Two highways, both dirt. I hear they're tar now. But back then, in the early 80s, they were, they were imagine a dirt road a thousand miles long. And um, that was the beginning of it. I talked my friend Mike into it. Let's do this. Let's go to Seward, Alaska, 100 miles south of Anchorage. So the call to adventure, that's the first thing uh, that, that uh, Campbell um, puts before us. The hero has got to have some kind of idea that they got to do something. Same thing with Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. He's got, he gets a call to adventure, chapter one. Um, and, and he's going to go on a journey a year later, right? No story about a knight or a hero who just sits around is interesting. They got to do something. They got to get out there. Campbell says early on in the, uh, in the hero journey cycle, there is something called the refusal of the call. I never refused the call. But holy cow, was there a terrible moment in the middle of our journey. It took 17 days. It took us 17 days to go 4,700 miles. This was a super bad, dangerous, I'm early 20s and I'm out of my mind uh, kind of thing to do. So watch it, Adam, and anybody who wants to head west. Girls can do it too. Women can do it too. But I think it's a dude thing. We just got to get out there and be a hero. My friend Mike, he refused the call in a huge way. Um, he started going out of his mind because he couldn't sleep. He had never camped before. I was sleeping like a baby. Uh, beneath the bridges we were sleeping at, by the railroad, in the woods, forest, wherever we were. And holy cow, did we get stuck at the uh, head of the Alcan Highway. Um, there was just this gas station there uh, run by these indigenous dudes. Um, I don't can't remember what tribe they were from, uh, what, what Indian nation. But we, we got stuck. And not only that, it was in the pouring rain by a place called the Skeen River. And Mike was just entering into a psychosis because it had been night after night after night of crap sleep. And there, there was a day, it was actually, we spent two nights at the Skeena River on the third day. The morning of the third day, he lost it. He completely lost it and started yelling and screaming at me. While I sat on this bridge with this crap cardboard sign that said, Alaska or bust. Again, this was a bad idea. But I got the story, don't I? So he's, he's yelling at me. He's yelling and screaming at me. And I, if you're a faithful person of any tradition, you'll get this. If you're not, you'll just forgive me. I prayed to God. I prayed. I said, you've got to get me out of here. I was worried Mike was getting going to get violent or something. You have got to get us out of here. And that brings me to item three in Campbell's um, deal. Supernatural aid. The hero gets supernatural aid. Something magic happens. An ogre or a wizard or somebody comes along and goes poof and everything's fine. Maybe a god or a goddess. Did, is this supernatural or just a coincidence? Half an hour, no more than 30 minutes after I vaunted that prayer, bounced it off a satellite into heaven. A in the pouring rain, a gigantic 18-wheel truck pulled up. And a little guy got out, and his name was Bobby Jim. He was from Birmingham, Alabama. How could I be making this up with a name like that? He looked us over pretty carefully, and we talked a little bit. And finally he said, all right, I'm going to give you guys a ride for a little while. And we got in the truck, and pretty soon we were fine. We were going down the road 65 miles an hour on a dirt road on an 18-wheel truck that was hauling pipe all the way to Homer, Alaska. And um, Bobby Jim came to trust us and like us in a minute. And uh, in the end, he took us within 100 miles of, of our destination. Coincidence or supernatural? Bobby Jim told us that early that morning, four hours earlier, he had left his glasses at a truck stop in British Columbia. He, he was having trouble reading the road signs. He could see the road pretty good, but he couldn't read the road signs, and he most definitely couldn't read the maps. And he needed us to do both. So we went thousands of miles. Uh, with him in that truck over a several day period, reading his, reading his map and reading the, the road signs to get us to uh, Alaska. We crossed the threshold uh, in several places. That's another uh, deal here. Um, 
crossing borders, crossing boundaries. Uh, I don't know if I can flesh that one out as thoroughly as the others, but holy cow, was my, belly of the whale is one of them, right? Uh, Joseph Campbell says that there's always a moment where the hero just gets completely destitute and just thinks, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to make it. That belly of the whale um, was probably Mike's moment at the Skeena River, although I might have had a, a, a pause or two. And belly of the whale, of course, is an evocation of Jonah, uh, that biblical character who just doesn't want anything to do with God. He refuses the call, too. He's like, I'm not doing this, man. He even tries to kill himself. And God just keeps pranking him. Has a whale scoop him up, spits him out on a beach three days later, and God says, Jonah, okay, you got to warn these people in this city um, that they're in trouble and they better mend their ways. And he's like, all right. And uh, if you know the story, you know the story. And if you don't, oh, that's all right. The Road of uh, Trials uh, was definitely uh, part of this journey. I, all kinds of dangerous stuff happened to me up there. I fell off a mountain that I shouldn't have been climbing, fell down an ice chute, fell off a halibut boat uh, into 40 degree water when I was clubbing halibut with a bat or shooting him with a gun because they'll, they'll, ki they'll kill you or break your leg. Um, that was the worst job I ever had. Lots of trials, lots of adventures and uh, uh, misadventures. And one of the things on Campbell's list that I ticked is that hero stories often have a temptress. A woman comes along who tries to get the hero to do stuff that he should not. And we have, I'm weaving back and forth a little bit here, but not only did I have a temptress in Southeast Alaska, a sweet woman, but there was also, there's also a temptress in Sir Gawain. There's a woman that's gonna try to, she's gonna enter Gawain's bed three mornings in a row to try to get him to kiss her. And I'll let you read the story and find out if he's, if he's gonna do that or not. I won't be your spoiler alert there, but Truth be told, I met a beautiful woman in southeast Alaska while I was living in this tent at the base of this mountain, Mount Marathon. Her name was Gigi Arino, and she was from Chico, California. She works in the agriculture industry now. She's a big deal. And we, we kind of half fell in love with each other. Never did anything more than hold hands, I can promise you that. But by the end of that summer, we had spent a lot of time together, and I was starting to get a little bit torn. And was I going to go home to Minnesota to the big question mark down here? Or was I going to do what Gigi wanted me to do at the end of the summer? She wanted me to go across the straits to the Soviet Union and get on the Trans-Siberian Railroad with her and come home uh, west to east, not east to west, like I was thinking of getting back uh, home. And I, I, I got a little bit um, puzzled. And <clears throat> there's also always, uh, um, maybe this is supernatural aid, but there's often in Campbell's theories, in hero stories, there's like a mystic or a seer that uh, helps people uh, know what to do. Now I want to tell you a little something. Uh, Seward, Alaska is a beautiful town. It was destroyed by a, a tsunami in 1964, a huge earthquake, sent a wall of water into Resurrection Bay, destroyed the town, killed a ton of people, and they had to start all over. And uh, I was looking at a Seward that had been uh, put back together. And I was, again, I'm there in uh, 1983. Here's a story within the story, and here's kind of the important part, and this ain't easy to talk about. When I got into Seward, Alaska, maybe a couple of thousand people, fishing town, I noticed right away that there was a guy walking all over town that looked, and was, probably, a, like a crazy person. Um, he, had a, he had a nickname from the town, and the nickname was Spaceman Bruce. He had dreadlocks, and he was filthy, and he was barefoot, and his feet looked terrible. And he had this pack, and um, he was the pariah of that town. He was the social pariah, the, the marginalized character. And I think he later got better. There's proof of it on the internet. But that particular summer, Spaceman Bruce was having a terrible time because earlier that year, Spaceman Bruce's uh, parents had decided to try to help them out, so they bought him a house, a little log cabin, also at the base of Mount Marathon. And the first thing Bruce did was take a chainsaw and cut a hole in the wall so dogs could come in and out of the cabin whenever they wanted. And that became a ser serious source of irritation, a nuisance for the neighbors. And about a month before I arrived in Alaska, Bruce had been told by the local sheriff, if you don't get rid of these dogs, I'm going to shoot them. I'm going to give you till Saturday. Bruce didn't get rid of the dogs. And on Saturday of that week, that dog, that sheriff, did what he was, said he was going to do. And he came to Bruce's place when he wasn't there. He was out in the woods. And he shot all the dogs, eight, nine, ten dogs, left them in the yard. 
and Bruce just lost it. And he went internal. And he decided to completely stop talking to anyone. He didn't talk to, I didn't see him talk to anyone that summer. I saw people try to engage Bruce. Uh, I also saw people taunting Bruce that summer. The way you would taunt a kid on a third grade playground, right? And which I thought was really mean spirited. And what the main thing I felt from him was um, trouble, static, but also a gentleness. He wasn't out to hurt anybody, you guys. He was just trying to survive like all of us. And he had uh, left his house and he had created a camp in the woods in this beautiful forest, which is pretty dangerous because there's brown bears up there that'll kill you dead. And um, I'm, I'm trying to emphasize something here. No one talked to him. He was alone. Uh, great solitude is what I observed in him. At the end of that summer, and here's the part of the story that's not entirely appropriate because most of you are pretty young, but I gotta tell the story true. At the end of that summer, ticking off the second to the last box on my own hero story, which I think parallels the hero stories that we're reading. And again, be careful if you feel like enacting this. I got more to say about that with your second lesson this week. There was a morning late in that summer, early, yeah, it was late August, and there hadn't been a lot of fish that year because there was a fish strike, and it's a long story, uh, fisherman strike, and I had heard this little rumor that there might be some boats coming in with halibut, and that there might be some hours at the cannery, and I wanted to get those hours. So I set my alarm in my crap tent that was always soaked with rain because it never stops raining in that most beautiful place I've ever been. And um, I, I got up early. And in the rain, I went to uh, sit outside Seward Fishery before it was even opened. I was there about 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning, all by myself, sitting on a pier, looking at the mountains and looking at the water and trying to figure out what I should do um, in terms of my next move. Out of the blue, suddenly, I heard the scuffle of gravel. I heard footsteps, and I turned, and Bruce was walking toward me. He was walking toward me, and I thought, he's, he's gonna, something's, something's going on, he's coming after me. And Bruce came down, and he gently sat next to me. He smelled terrible. Boy, did he smell terrible. No showers in the mountains. And he said to me, again, very gently, what are you thinking, what are you thinking about? What are you sitting here thinking about? And I'm like, Bruce is talking to me. He doesn't talk to anybody. I said, you know what? I'm, I'm trying to figure out what to do with my life. I'm 23 years old, and I'm not sure which direction I, I want to go in. What path? He said, well, what are your options? What are you considering? I said, well, I've kind of half fallen in love with a woman here uh, that I met this summer in the cannery. She wants me to go to the Soviet Union with her and ride home uh, on the Siberian Trans-Siberian Railroad. But I'm also kind of in love with my college, uh, with the woman I met at my university in Minnesota. Um, but she's not sure about me. And uh, she's kind of also involved with a friend of mine. I don't know what, exactly what to do. I also told him, I'm thinking about teaching. I'm thinking about taking up the teaching life. And uh, I don't remember what he said about the women. Maybe nothing. But Bruce said, I think the teaching life sounds fantastic. I think it would be a good life to be a teacher. You should think about that. You should think about being a teacher. And I sat there thinking, he's right. Here's the awkward part, but again, i got to tell it true. In that next moment, Bruce took out a very strange pipe, obviously made out of like some plumbing materials, and he took out some even stranger-looking marijuana. And in silence, at 6 o'clock in the morning, I got high with Spaceman Bruce, and I decided right then and there, to become a teacher. That's why I'm talking to you right now, all these years in the future. He was right. And then he said, would you ice halibut with me today? Would you work with me today? And I said, yes. And we walked into the cannery and just draws drop. They're like, what is going on? Bruce is with Jeff Johnson. And we worked a 12-hour shift in complete silence, packing away halibut for the restaurant industry. A few years ago, I googled Spaceman Bruce, Seward, Alaska, and I found out that he really became a fixture and a character in that town. Here's a photograph of him as an old man. I was trying to say it. Bruce, I found him on the internet later. I entered Spaceman Bruce in Seward, Alaska. He became a character, a fixture in that town for years. Later took a kayak, uh, 
kayaked all the way from Alaska to Northern California. It took him six years. And uh, he died shortly after he got out of that kayak on the beach near the ocean that he loved. Heart attack. And when I came home from Alaska, hitchhiking all the way back, I got dropped off in Brainerd, Minnesota at a water tower that you none of you would know, but all my kids who heard the story yesterday went, we know that water tower. And uh, I was supposed to come home with all kinds of money. And I actually had one dime in my pocket. And I called my dad, uh, who was at our family lake home 20 minutes away. And he came and yelled at me. And he told me, you are a very expensive son. And I said, I know, Dad, but would you want it any other way? And with that last moment, I ticked the last box in Campbell's deal. Atonement with the Father. So, that's my story. It's a pretty good one. Um, now that it's blurred into comp too. Get going on uh, Sir Godwin and the Green Knight. I'll get this video uh, edited and loaded up for you. And I'll have another two more coming at you this week. And again, to repeat myself, only two next week because my nose is itching. Sorry. Um, we've got a short week next week with break um, for Riverland College and uh, Central Lakes College begins the same week. I wonder if you guys have Friday off next week. I better double check on that. Stay safe. God bless you. I love you guys. I love you Riverlanders and Long Prairie Gray Eagleites. Here's my arrow.